thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. It's my first time in Vietnam, uh, so it has been a very big experience to, to see how your, your country is working. Uh, I'll talk about fish, and uh, fish swim in water, so that's my excuse. And the second thing I will is that I probably might go wrong some places, because I have not been here for a long time, and my, my uh, reference points are, of course, partly European, and uh, where I have worked most within the Vietnamese fisheries sector is actually on international trade. That's where I have my publications. Um, and um, we will see what we can do and work our way through it, and I hope for a very, very good discussion afterwards. I will be a bit political today. Um, bear over with me. Uh, because our experiences from Europe is that it takes generations to rectify past neglect or, and mismanagement of renewable fish resources. They are renewable, but it takes quite a long time. We also, I also want to come with a second statement, which says that a common understanding of the need for management and regulations of a common resource as fish is needed for the success of a common fisheries policy. And that stems from the fact that fishermen do not most often like to be regulated. They do not like any kind of management. They'd like to decide for themselves. So if you don't have the fishermen on your side, it's very difficult to regulate the fishery. And then the last one is, we have a lot of problems, and, or challenges, I should call it, and uh, it needs more than one tool to rectify more than one challenge. And that means it needs a whole suit of integrated policies, both at local, national, and international uh, level, to actually utilize the science and management knowledge we have to get a sustainable development. I will come back to this because it is the sheer integration problem that is the most pertinent in, in this development. So, what do I want to talk about? First of all, I of course will set the scene for both Vietnam and, and Europe. Uh, we do know, all of us, that we have overfishing overcapitalization, technological achievements and international trade, which all draw these challenges. And then I want to discuss with you why fisheries management does not succeed, look a little bit about the fisheries management in Vietnam and in Europe, and uh, maybe together with you pinpoint the pitfalls. And then I will actually discuss how we might uh, also use the international trade and the markets to increase the economic value of the fish stocks instead of just overfishing. It's a question of quality contra uh, quantity. And then I have a lot of nasty open questions for you. So, let's take the first here. Why does this not show. Okay, I'll take both of them. Um, this stems from a PhD dissertation by one of my colleagues uh, that is with the fisheries ministry in uh, Hanoi. Uh, he, he, uh, he defended his PhD thesis in April and I was so fortunate to be on his assessment committee. And I called him and asked if I could use his material, and he was very forthcoming. So it's thanks to him that I actually can show you uh, the number of boats and the total landings and quite a few other uh, five, six slides uh, that I've taken out of his dissertation. This shows with no doubt that the number of vessels 
and the total landings have gone straight up. I mean, it looks like any other place where you have open access and nothing to, no barriers to enter new boats uh, and no barriers to actually fish what you can. It's, and the results, they do actually present themselves. What do we see? We see where we are. Then we see the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And if you go through it in more details when you get the slides, uh, you will see that all the regions have falling stocks. All regions are going straight down uh, as far as I can see. It's, there is no news in this. This is what everybody knows. Uh, but, of course, something, ha something has to do something about it. I'll give you the same for uh, one of the biggest uh, stocks we have in Europe and one of the most economic uh, important stocks. These are catches, recruitments, fishing pressure and stock size for the cod in the North Atlantic. And, yeah, it's taking a bit longer time uh, for, for Europe to fish it out. Uh, if you go to around 80, that's when it t really goes wrong, goes straight down. Uh, same goes for the fishing pressure, because there is no fish to fish, so you're bound to, to lower the, the pressure. You have the stock size, and we get all the way to 2005 before we actually see a change uh, in the stock size. And that didn't come by itself, just to say the least. Uh, in a country like mine, Denmark, we have gone from 1980 to today, we have gone from 14,000 fishermen, professional fishermen, to less than 2,000 today. And we have paid them out and decommissioned their boats. So what, what is the success criteria here? What is it we want? Of course we want to safeguard the stocks uh, so we have a long-term yield. We also want to lay the foundations for a profitable industry. I mean, the success criteria must be protecting the ecosystem uh, for a future harvest, but we also have to protect the fishermen. And uh, then we need uh, to discuss the uh, e e equity. I mean, uh, Dr. Tree said that uh, the poorer were getting poorer and the richer were getting richer. It's the same here. Um, we are, by not having the overall good fisheries management, we are actually allocating poverty to those fishermen that are out in, on the coast. And of course we need to uh, conserve the marine resources. I mean, nothing is new here. It is like that. So, what did Wu Hai actually center in on in his PhD? He said he looked at the challenges first not the, the things that actually works, because I will give you a list of what I found to be really promising. But he said there were poor compliance with regulations. That goes with my first statement. Uh, you need to be in line with the fishermen to actually be able to make them comply with regulations. They have to see that these are the right thing to do. Then we have weak inform uh, enforcement of the regulations that's already here in Vietnam. Uh, I can't say if that's correct or not, but uh, I trust his work. Then I would like to discuss a bit with you about top-down government uh, way of regulation. There is very little room for co-management. And then uh, he claims that the there is a poor data collection system. I do have a feeling that this data is probably collected. <laughs> uh, 
and a lot of scientists here are very good. So you probably know. The question is whether the advisory system and the institutional framework actually gets where it's needed. But that's something you hopefully can tell me more about afterwards. If we take the planning system, I've never seen anything like it, to be honest. This is uh, the planning system for Vietnam, where you have a general uh, socio-economic planning system, and you have a fisheries planning system. Most of it happens at national and regional level, a little bit more on, on uh, provincial level. On district level, there's hardly anything uh, uh, when it comes to fisheries planning system. And at the commune level, uh, not, nothing either. Uh, and that means that these fisheries scientists and NGOs, uh, as I asked earlier, they're talking into thin air, if I can understand this. Uh, and the local fisheries communities, they have a very, very long uh, way up to the provincial headquarters to, to state their case. There is no institution that safeguards the cooperation between uh, the fishing communities and the planning system. Second thing about planning system is that they can be seen as a law that you have to reach the success criteria of the plan. If it, and if that says that you have to fish 40% more, then there will be a tendency that people will yeah, cheat with the data simply and, and send the message, we're fine, we've done what we should. And that, of course, influences the data stream uh, of, 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 on which the scientists make the assessments for the future advice. Uh, and then the system doesn't work. Uh, of course it doesn't. have a few more um, ways of saying the same. Um, there is a proper and adaptive institutional framework available, as far as I can see. But I'm not sure it works within this planning system we've just seen. Because uh, the NADAREP or the National Department of Aquatic Resource Exploitation and Protection, as well as the department from the department uh, of a department of Ministry of Fisheries, they have the responsibility for managing both the capture fishery and protect the aquatic environment and resources. That means it's there. But the problem is, can they do the same thing at the same time? Don't they get into conflict with themselves? Should these two tasks not have been divided so that one section actually only works with the protection so that they don't interact with how much fish we should catch? I mean, we have seen it other places that, that the departments of fishery very often will feel themselves as a voice for the sector. And if they are a voice for the sector, they will do what the sector can do to earn enough money instead of protecting the background because it has a short-sighted aim, not a long-term conservationist uh, influence. Then we have uh, the MFST, as far as I can find. In the marine fisher this is the marine fishery specialist team that was established on in the support program 2.1 to 2.12. That's the NIDA. I mean, I'm, I'm, I come from Denmark, so this interests me a bit, okay? Uh, what I can see is that these projects that were funded by Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and a lot of others on co-management that should actually safeguard that one task between the fisheries and fishermen communities uh, to min the ministry and, and be 
have a shared responsibility for the management. Uh, most of these institutional frameworks were actually closed the day the funding stopped. And that means we didn't get the long-term influence of that capacity building. But of course, the knowledge is out there, so it would be able to revive some of it because you didn't have to start from scratch. Um, there is a stock assessment and there are data sampling that are carried out continuously. I do doubt how good they are, uh, but you will tell me uh, whether or not you trust the data or they are a function of the planning process. So, I will flag my in in ignorance here. Because when I look at it, I see a sector, how I see that the development of the fisheries sector shows how the transition from a planning economy to a mixed market and planning economy uh, experience conflicting development paths. And that means, yeah, it basically means that old habits die hard. If you're used to plan and you're used to follow the planning, it's very, very difficult to use the market forces and a more bottom-up approach to future decisions. And what we see here is that the growth paradigm, contrabalance, so, uh, sustainable growth strategy is, uh, is in conflict. And you need the policy to change so that you can get the right decisions. And I can't tell you what the right decisions are, because the right decisions for you is not the same as it would be in, in Europe. Of course not. Because it's geographically uh, specific, it's site specific, it's context specific. I mean, and it is policy. And policy is going to be created by politicians with knowledge. Uh, and that's why I keep on asking, how do we get the knowledge to the politicians so that they take the right decisions? Because that's our task, to make sure that they know. Then, I have the problem with the facilitation from the international communities, um, because I think they have had too little impact. Might not be right, but... I don't see the changes that I see other places in the world when we look at, at, uh, at projects. But, okay. So, governance, old habits die hard. I flag my ignorance. Then we have the trade sector. Vietnam has been extremely successful. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at the DG Sankos, which is... Uh, Food security, uh, general directorate, it has a <laughs> French name. <laughs> um, the criteria have been met and there has been an extremely big increase in, uh, in growth. I'll come back with some reflections on this growth potential uh, a little later. Let's take this one. It's one uh, Abu Hais as well. Um, if you see how, how uh, well this looks, uh, you can see that... Thank you. Uh, this one. You can see that you have a, a pilot project here which actually... Uh, made sure that you got good advice that had assessments and had good data. And, of course, the minister is going to, or the ministry, actually maybe not the minister alone, but the government sh takes decisions. And they advise after request, which is a normal procedure. Then we have um, the summary sheets with the indicators, 
which means that if you know the catch rates, the composition, the effort, uh, the activities and the economic performance of the fleets, you can actually take good decisions if you have this knowledge. And then you can use the ecosystem and resource profiles indicator, which is abundance and biomass habitats and what the, what the fisheries biologists talk about to actually make sure that you also include the fishermen in your decisions, which means that you know something about their vessel activities, you know something about movement and space, and you know uh, something about, um, it says what are the roles of middlemen here, but what you need to do is actually to know something about the supply chain and how long it is and how many people actually get a living out of these fish. Uh, because maybe it shouldn't be hampering the fishermen, it should actually maybe hamper some of those traders in between so that there was more money to the primary, uh, uh, primary sector. Keep this. Okay. I will not use a lot of time on talking about my own country uh, or my own, uh, but you should know that how it, it, it runs, because it runs in a way that we have an overall quota system, which builds on the fishery before 73. That means it's historically how the quotas are divided between the countries in Europe. Uh, they don't comply completely the different countries to these rules. Of course not, because we have an, a conflict, a principal agent conflict, where it actually might be in one country's best interest to cheat. And they do that. Of course they do. Um, but not as much as many other places. So then the next problem is that a big part of these quotas are allocated internally in the individual countries. And they use ITQs, which leads to a concentration of quotas on very few hands. And we call them quota kings. Because all the small ones, they, yeah, they sell their quota because it's not profitable for them to, to fish under those conditions. Um, when you have a quota system, the resource rent, that means what you should under normal conditions pay to the fish per se, uh, that goes to individuals and not to society. If you use the tax system like you do in Greenland, then the resource rent would be harvested to the public and they could build schools and make roads and health out of it instead. Uh, but, and the, third, the last thing I want to say is that transition from one system to the other or from overfishing to sustainability is tedious, hard and costly. Um, that's the short presentation. I can give you a lot more, but I'll just show you the pictures that you can find on the home page. So how is it built up? Just to say that you have to think of everything. You have the MSY, which is um, the maximum sustainable yield. You have regionalization, you have fisheries science, and you have multi-annual plans because fishermen don't like to know that they can fish a lot this year and nothing next year. That doesn't work. If you, you keep your, your mind on the first one a bit, this MSY, because I come back to that one, this one, that's, that's a bit strange, because I'm absolutely not in agreement. Uh, we take the next one here. So what else do you have to do? You have to have a lot of rules. We have a lot of rules. What else? You don't want discards. You don't want high grading, as it's called. If you catch fish, big fish have usually a higher kilo price than small fish. Some species have higher kilo pr prices than other fish sp species. So what they do is that they fish, and then they take the best, and, and then they throw the rest out. We don't want that. 
I mean, you have a multi-species fishery and the, 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 the chances of high grading is the same or the risk of high grading is the same. Then you have some targeted funding, you have some aquaculture and you have some control and you have a lot of money allocated for control purposes. So, you know what this is? This is Copenhagen Harbor around year 1555. The whole of my country built on herring. The wealth built on herring. They could walk on them, they claim, in the Middle Ages. And uh, there are not much left, but uh, still, we, uh, we're, we're happy they were there, or we wouldn't be. Another example is um, the Norwegian uh, spring spawning herring. Um, they fished it almost up. In 1970, they had to uh, stop fishing it completely. And we couldn't start fishing it again before 1990. It just tells how bad it can go uh, if you don't take uh, any uh, measures. And how bad is it in EU today? There is a recovery plan for cod, one for Hague, 2004, 2005, still in motion. There is for Seoul in the Bay of Biscay. There is measures for the recovery of eel. That's not our faults alone. Um, then there is Greenland halibut and latest uh, bluefin tuna. Uh, I mean, it's not that it has been very good. We have had 30 years to do it and it doesn't work. So let's get back to um, some theory because I'm going to continue where Professor Tree actually stopped. Because we have some methods to actually know something about uh, how we should actually manage. We have some, some methods that we could look at and then we can work from there in the geographically, site and context specific fashion. I made the DPSR example and I'll work on it again on Monday where you will be the ones working on it, uh, those of you that go for the urban water. Uh, because we want to make one of these for the urban water. Um, can, you, can you imagine uh, the drivers of change? The market drivers are those that want to buy the fish. Then if you subsidize the fishery as you do in Vietnam with new boats, in some provinces, then it will drive extra fishery. Then you have different kinds of regulations or lack of them that might actually drive the fishery and the overfishery. Then you have the need for occupation, simply the need for work and income. And then, of course, if you get technological changes so you can catch the double, because the boat is at, as double as efficient, then, of course, it will come out as pressures, which is catch and efforts. So what happens with catch and efforts? The state changes is the changes out in the sea. Uh, and uh, these changes are, of course, changes in the stock dynamics, food webs, uh, yeah, dynamic interactions, they are the bycatch uh, from other fisheries, which is a European problem, not the same here because you have a multi-species fishery. You can have destruction of habitats because you have trolls that scrape the bottom. Uh, there are many issues here that you have to take into account. So what does it give, give us? I mean, what's the trade-off between these state changes and our welfare? Because our welfare is, of course, food security. We get a better quality of uh, food if we get fish. We have employment, income, economic revenue, recreational values uh, of, uh, of these areas, and we have some cultural changes. And then comes the fun part, because the response on this 
can be very, very diff different because we could actually, if we see that the overfishing and the destruction of the habitats in the fishery will eventually lead to lack of fish, lack of income, lack of, lack of jobs in the fishery, then we can start thinking about how are we going to change the behavior the different places. We can go directly and change the drivers. You can simply um, prohibit uh, uh, um, the number of, of boats. You can make marine protected areas. You can, you can say you cannot use mesh sizes that are bigger in this and that. Uh, there are many ways of doing that. You can go directly on the, on the catch and effort, saying we do not want more ships than this. Uh, and you cannot catch more than that. Uh, you can go on the state changes over there and see if you can invest in rebuilding some of these destructive practices uh, by, for example, making uh, marine protected areas. The welfare changes, you all know. I mean, you can actually go in and retrain people to do other jobs if you can pull them out of the fishery. But then, on the other hand, you have to make sure that others don't go in and take their place. I mean, this is, this is a short version of uh, that it can be regulated and managed over a whole series of levels. If we take the real modern one, we look at it from an ecosystem uh, management perspective. I will, I will jump that very fast. But um, we have to know what the intermediate services are, the final services and the welfare benefits, and how we actually connect the natural sciences with the social sciences when we talk about fisheries. That's the same in every sector. We have to go through these motions. Now comes this one. Now I will be a real economist. See, the top one was the one you saw uh, from, uh, from, from the EU. This is the standard uh, assessment model that is usually used uh, to not in practice, actually, but to explain how this is actually uh, working. Up here, you have the yield. This is the assessment curve. Uh, this is the, f the, f the fish dock, no, the fish catches under different fishing efforts, which is usually uh, days at sea for a standard vessel. How much do they fish? And if you have more fishing effort, then you get lower catches in the long run. And this is a cost line. And it shows that under normal circumstances in our time, then there is an overfishing of, you know, this much. Um, and that means that if you could actually decrease the fishing effort to this point, you would get a maximum of fish. If you would decrease it further, you could get the maximum economic yield, which means that the difference between the income and the cost would be the most and would actually give us the highest fishing rent. Uh, and that's what happens when you have quotas that can be bought and sold individual transferable quotas. That is that they will buy up the quotas and then they will reduce the fishing effort so they make the most uh, out of it. But that means that this over normal profit here goes straight into the pockets of those few people that has been able to buy all the quotas. If you... Um, if you subsidize the fishery, the costs will fall, and that will create even more fishing effort and even less fish. Just to get it straight. 
You can do that with all the different regulations, you can put them into this model. I have a few reflections on uh, trade, because um, if you have less fish you can catch, and less fishery, then at least you could get the most out of it. You could get higher prices if you have a better quality, but that needs, means that you have to have a system where you have a quality classification system in place, so people will actually believe you when you tell them that this is actually highest quality. Then there is a way of allocating the fish in the market so that it, it ends up with those consumers that has the highest spending power. Some markets will pay more than others for the same fish. Then we know that shorter supply uh, chains will get better out outcome and income for the fishermen. And in most places it's a question of middlemen. How do you cut them out? And you do that by market information for sellers and buyers and by choosing the right market from these informations. And these informations are important uh, because that means that anybody with a mobile phone can actually find out where they can get most for their fish. And then the middlemen can't cheat them the same as they used to. Then we have um, product diversification and branding, of course. Uh, you know that a t-shirt with a nice crocodile on the side uh, costs more than one of without. Then we have certification and labeling, which you have uh, engaged in in many respects, but that could be actually be further developed so that you could actually meet the, those consumer preferences for environmental protection, food safety, and social responsibility, the CSR, uh, that uh, many consumers, especially in Europe, are willing to pay extra for. So this is just that side of it. There's lots of, of work on it. So what do we do? We make sure that the, our consumers uh, know how um, what they get, and then we make sure that those countries that export to the European markets also know what we want. And uh, we claim that uh, the consumers have the right to know about the food operator, the weight, the fishing gear used, the scientific name, uh, under which conditions it has been stored, uh, where it's caught, all these funny things has to be on the label. Uh, it also makes it possible to withdraw a lot if it shows out that it's filled with pesticides or something others that we don't want. This whole thing, it costs money. And this is what is used in uh, Europe from 2014 to 2020. Uh, part of it is managed through the European Union, but most of it is actually as close to the decision makers as possible. So, and what are the problems you want to, to reach? Um, you want the sustainable fishery. So it costs money to change into a sustainable fishery. That's where the bulk goes. And that's creating other jobs for people, development to support marketing and processing, then you have to control it or it won't work. Then you need a lot of money to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And then uh, you want to develop alternatives so that people don't get unemployed. Uh, these slides will be made available to you, uh, of course. Won't they, Stefani? Now I have... Uh, Taking these uh, statements again, I will not repeat them. I will just put the questions to you. Um, because my problem is, is it actually fair to the fishermen to choose a management scheme which erodes their livelihood in uh, short to medium term? Is that right? Morally, ethically, however? 
How do we deal with aggravated social inequality uh, that we heard about a minute ago? Um, when uh, investments in the more well-off, uh, in larger boats and better technology uh, actually uh, erodes the livelihood of the small-scale fishermen on shore. Should, the question here is, do we want to pay what it costs to keep them, uh, the coastal fishermen, uh, at an income level where it is decent to live? Or do you want a change uh, so that retraining, building other industries and so forth in the coastal regions actually gets people over in other jobs? How do you safeguard both the fish stocks' productivity and the environment they live in? That's a broader environmental uh, discussion uh, which has to be taken into account. And then how do we change the decision-making process to include the stakeholders uh, so that we uh, get that. So that would be my, my uh, contribution today. And uh, of course, when you get it, there is some literature and acknowledgments uh, uh, at the behind, which you are welcome to, to uh, say. <laughs>